one of C.S. Lewis's novels in the Chronicles of Narnia, he wrote, what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. So what you see and what you hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. And I think when, when we're talking about this topic of perspective, right, this, this perspective, in this day of age, and age, this quote is true. Our perspective has an impact on what we see and what we hear and how we respond to it. So often in our life, we may be in the exact same situation as someone else. We might see and hear the same thing as the person next to us, but we get totally different things out of it, right? And I have a couple of examples on the screen here. So th this first example is a picture of two guys. Both of them, they're stranded. Um, one stranded on a boat, one stranded on land, right? What these guys are seeing and what they're excited about depends completely on their position. It depends on where they're standing. The one in the boat's excited about land. The one in, on the land is excited about the boat, right? But they're both in the same situation, just different perspectives. The next one, we can see um, two people looking at the same number, one of them sees the number six, one of the, them sees the number nine. Which one's right? I don't know. They're both in the same situation, looking at the same thing, but with a different perspective. And now, this next one is slightly controversial. You might remember it um, from, I think, about two years ago. It was all over um, Facebook. It was, I think it was on the news. I remember hearing about it on um, the radio, even 96.5. Um, this dress, now what's controversial about this dress or why it was a hot topic was to do with the colour of it. And I, I want to do a little experiment here this morning. Who of you sees this dress as white and gold? Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Who sees it as black and blue? Yeah, that's really interesting. Who sees something else in completely differently? <laughs> what are you going? <laughs> wow. Blue and gold? Yeah, I can see a bit of blue and gold. We do know a good optometrist here at this church, so that's good if your eyesight is. <laughs> um, now, this dress is actually blue and black. So this dress is actually blue and black. But most people, when they first saw it, they saw it as white and gold. So you guys who did see it as white and gold, you're not alone. This is, it's very common. And the reason for this is actually to do with our perspective and our assumptions around the lighting that this picture is taken in. So we can't tell the exact lighting situation from this picture. Was it taken outside or inside? Has it been lit up from the front of the dress or from the back of the dress? We can't tell those things. Um, so what happens is our brain automatically fills in those gaps. It makes assumptions based around our perspective of the lighting conditions. And those assumptions is what causes us to see it in different colours, which I thought was actually really interesting. Our perspective is obviously really important, right? It has the power to change the way we see things. It has the power to change the way that we respond and the way that we act in situations. So what does this mean for us today as the church and as followers of Jesus? And does our perspective matter in our walk with God? And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So today, as I mentioned, we will be continuing our series through the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And we will be reading um, the, the letter written to the church in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. So in order to better understand this letter that's being written, it's good to understand a little bit of context around it. Sardis was an active and commercial city. It was known for being very wealthy. And because of the wealth of this city and the riches that the church enjoyed, this led to a church that hadn't suffered too much persecution and it was quite sheltered, particularly in comparison with some of the other churches um, we've, we've read about in this series. So, so it was, yeah, it was quite a sheltered church. 
So we're going to read now from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. It says, to the, angels, uh, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people inside us who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their name, the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has he ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for your word. Lord, we thank you that it is sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, we thank you that it is living and active. Um, and Lord, yeah, we just pray right now that you would be giving us ears to hear, giving us eyes to see what you have to say to us to, uh, this morning. In your name, amen. Amen. So in all the letters that we've seen to the churches so far, despite their faults, Christ has re recognised and acknowledged a lot of good in them. In this letter to Sardis, we find something quite different. No good is actually mentioned here. In fact, what Christ is doing is he's actually pointing out something that in their eyes and to them would have been a major achievement, something they would have held uh, in high esteem and been very proud of, and that's their reputation. The church in Sardis was known for being alive. It had a reputation in, in its city, in the town, in the church, for, for its life and for its activity. But what does Christ have to say about this reputation? That there is no basis for it. In fact, they are dead. This is a heavy condemnation. And I can imagine that, that this church must have been feeling quite confused. If everyone around them is saying that they are alive, how can they be dead? This is blunt, sharp condemnation from God. And it shows that reputation means very little in his eyes. And it's obvious through, through verse 3 that this church is actually unaware of its own spiritual state. This is a dangerous place to be in. In the eyes of the world, in the eyes of those around the church, this church was very much alive. But in the eyes of Christ, the church was dead. So what was it that they were getting so wrong? When I was younger, I, um, my brother actually had a pet fish. And it was one of those pretty... Siamese fighting fish, the blue and red ones. Um, we had a fish because we couldn't have other pets. Fish were meant to be easy to look after, um, all, all that kind of thing, uh, cheap, ev everything like that. And, and this fish was, was definitely my brother's because he brought it with his own money, it lived in his room, all that kind of stuff. But for whatever reason, I found myself being the one to have to feed it and, and, and clean its... Um, tank and, and all that kind of thing. And, and my, I know that it's not very hard <laughs> with a Siamese fighting fish because you feed them once every couple of days and um, clean their tank every now and again. But my perspective was this fish was a little bit of a waste of time, waste of effort, waste of energy, because it wasn't mine and I had to do all the cleaning for it. And parents, I, you, you probably understand where I'm coming from a little bit. <laughs> uh, so one day, I was feeding this fish, and I was getting ready to clean its tank. And I, I walked up to it, and I saw the fish was actually lying down on its side, on the, on the bottom of the tank. <laughs> and I must admit, based on my perspective of, of this fish, I was a little bit excited that... <laughs> 
so I, I, you know, I did the quick check, I tapped the glass, I swished the water around, it didn't move, I thought, great. And I went to the toilet bowl, like we see in the movies, and I put it in the toilet bowl. And as soon as I did that, the fish started swimming around. <laughs> oh. It was very alive, and it, it was very much okay. I'm not sure what it was doing, sleeping maybe, maybe it was scared, but it was, it was very alive. I got it back out um, and, and yeah, made it better, and it lived for, for a while after that. <laughs> but my perspective was that this fish was a waste of time, effort, and energy. So the way that I dealt with this situation was very different to if my brother, who, who loved this fish and, and wanted to take care of it, if he had found it the way I found it, he would have dealt with it very differently. My perspective changed the way I acted and changed the way I, I um, responded in this situation. Now, Sardis, the church in Sardis was looking at their success with the wrong perspective. They were measuring their, their spiritual state and their success based on things that were important in the eyes of the world, things that ultimately are temporary. This can include things like church attendance, size of the building, number of members, ranges of activities, responses in worship, giving, programs, ministries, etc., etc. And don't get me wrong, None of these things in and of themselves are wrong or bad in any way. The issue was, the church in Sardis, despite having these things and despite its activities, its deeds, as we see in verse 2, were unfinished and incomplete. Despite all these things, there was no substance because they had neglected to keep the gospel at the centre of all that they did. They had temporary perspectives. So, God had a strong warning for them. He has nothing good to say about this situation. And he urges them to wake up, to open their eyes, to see things through the eyes of Christ and the lens of the gospel. They need a change in perspective. This is obviously a very serious matter in God's eyes. He is urging the church in Sardis to do away with their worldly perspective. But before we come down too hard on Sardis, we need to recognise that this is a major problem in our churches today. Having a range of programs and ministries is useless unless it's done with the intention of sharing the gospel and producing lasting fruit. Having new buildings with heaps of volunteers it is of little importance if on the forefront of our minds is not how can we be using this to share Jesus with other people. Having all the Bible knowledge in the world is of no use if you are not using that knowledge to further the kingdom in your sphere of life. This passage isn't about how we measure a success of a church. It's about ensuring that everything that we do is done with an eternal perspective. Everything we do is done with an eternal perspective. We need to be keeping in check what is really important as opposed to that which is temporary. Now to take up an eternal perspective is to always keep in mind what is important to God. To remember that things of this world are temporary and eternity is important. It is to view the world the way Jesus viewed the world. If we don't intentionally bring eternity into the forefront of our minds, we may lose sight of it altogether. When eternity is forgotten, we become infatuated with that which is temporary. And, and for all of our efforts, we'll be left with temporary churches filled with temporary preaching of a temporary word that will at best push people to temporary change we value comfort and convenience over sharing the gospel and loving others. We, we become complacent in our practices and we miss opportunities to be bringing people a message of hope that could ultimately save them. What sadness would it bring to look like a church or a believer full of life in the eyes of the world? 
but with deeds that are incomplete in the eyes of Christ and to ultimately be categorized by death. Temporary perspective can blur our vision. It makes us lose sight of the fact that making disciples and sharing Jesus with others is an internal endeavor. It's something that we as the church today need to keep at the forefront of our minds, just as much as the church in Sardis did. We need an eternal perspective. Now, this passage tells us that there is still some aspects of the church in Sardis that are not completely lost yet. There's, there's still hope, although he does say that they are dying. So Christ's instruction to these, to these things, to this hope, is to strengthen it. Strengthen those things. And he gives two ways to do that. Number one, by keeping in mind the gospel. And number two, through repentance. So the first step, uh, step in strengthening and adopting an eternal perspective is to keep in mind the gospel. And for the church of Sardis, Christ uh, is, is telling them to remember specifically how they received the gospel in the first place. So what Christ is referring to here is actually their, their response to receiving the, the gospel. So not, not specifically how they were told about it, but how they as people received it. What was their attitude? What was their spirit towards the good news that brought them salvation? Well, when they first heard, they were zealous. They were repentant of their old way of living. They wanted to boldly share the good news with others, and they were committed to living a life for God. When I was younger, I was obsessed with all things horses. Uh, I loved horse toys, real horses. I just wanted to ride horses for the rest of my life. Um, I didn't end up doing that, but I remember one day being in Mr. Toy's Toy World, and I saw the most amazing toy, and, and I still remember it today. I think it was one of my favorites. I'm pretty sure it was a little, my, like a My Little Pony toy, and basically the horse attached to a, um, a ring, and you pushed a button and made it jump, so it would go around the ring and it would jump over the jumps. And, and you could brush the horse's hair and you had a little doll that sat on the horse. And when I saw this in Mr. Toy's Toy World, I thought, oh, wouldn't it just be amazing if I, if I could have this toy? And I let my parents know, um, quite not subtly, that I would love it for my birthday or for Christmas. So sure enough, my birthday came around and I was opening my presents and this toy was, was one of them. And I was overjoyed because I'd been thinking about this toy for a long time. And I, I was so excited. I, I took it everywhere I went. I took it to all my friends. I took it to my birthday party. I, I showed my friends how it worked. I let them play with it. I just wanted to share it with them. And I wanted to share my excitement with them because I thought that this toy was the most amazing thing that I'd ever received. I was overjoyed by it. After, after a little while of playing with this toy, uh, as I think a lot of things happen, um, but I, I did get bored of it after about a year. Um, I, I lost my joy around it. I stopped playing with it, and I no longer told people about it. The excitement and that awe and that joy that I had when I, when I first received the toy that is what God is calling Sardis to remember. The joy that a lot of us experience when we first respond to the gospel, the zeal and, and the, the passion that we have to share this good news with other people, that is what God is calling the church in Sardis to remember. And we often have this joy because when we first respond to the gospel, we are so aware of the weight of our sin and the beautiful gift of grace that we have received, right? We, we understand that this um, transformation and this transition from, from death to life and from darkness to light, we know that we are called righteous and that we are forgiven and we want to celebrate that. We understand the weight and the joy of our salvation, and the church in Sardis has lost sight of this. They've lost sight of the joy of their salvation and they are no longer zealous and passionate about sharing the gospel. 
They have become like I was when I lost the joy of my horse toy. Keeping in mind the joy of our salvation and not letting the gospel grow grow stale or cold or boring in our minds, this will drive us to want to share the good news of Jesus. This is what will drive us to keep an eternal perspective in everything that we do. The second thing that God is calling the church to is repentance. Because of their temporary perspective, they took their eyes off what was truly important, which is sharing the gospel well, and this had devastating effects on the members of the church and of the members of the community. So God is calling them to repent of this, to acknowledge what they were doing that was wrong, to turn from their ways and to once again be zealous in their pursuit of Christ, keeping him at the centre of everything that they do. One of the scariest things about this church, I believe, was that they were unaware of their spiritual state. A church that knows their spiritual state surrenders and submits to God and leans on his strengths to get through. But a church that does not know its spiritual state continues on their own strength and and continues doing many things, but achieving nothing. Their deeds are unfinished. And this is why repentance is so important. Because repentance is an active flee from sin and turn to God. You see, what repentance does is it acknowledges that which is wrong in the eyes of Christ And it brings sin out of darkness where it is in danger of being ignored, of being unfinished. And it brings it into the light where it can be seen, where it can be dealt with, and where the Bible says it can actually become light itself. God can use the darkness and the sin for his glory if we allow him, if we bring it to the light and if we repent. This is often a a difficult and a painful process, revealing the ugliness of our sin, but it is necessary to bring about the change that is needed in order for the church in Sardis to live the way God intended them to live, to turn from their temporary perspective and to adopt an eternal perspective. These instructions to keep in mind the joy of our salvation and to repent are just as applicable for us today as it was for the church in Sardis. We know that we are prone to having temporary perspectives, particularly when when we go about our daily lives and and particularly when, when we find ourselves in situations that can be frustrating or inconvenient to us in some way. But God is calling us to adopt eternal perspectives in these things, to keep the gospel at the center of everything that we do. This week, when when we go about our daily lives, when we see our friends or we see our family, how are you going to keep an eternal perspective when you speak to them? When you're driving on the road this week and someone cuts you off, how are you going to keep an eternal perspective when you you (laughs) react and when you respond to that situation? Our perspectives matter. When it is not focused on God, it can have devastating effects on the kingdom. When we take up an eternal perspective, we cannot help but change. The way that we work every day, the way that we go to work every day will look different. The way that we communicate with others will look different. The way that we parent will look different. Our routines and our priorities and our time will look different if we have an eternal perspective. And we need to keep strengthening this through remembering the joy of our salvation and through actively asking God to reveal to us ways in our lives that we have temporary perspectives and then through repenting of these things. As you go about this week, And and something that's really actually helped me personally in in trying to keep this, this is a difficult thing to do. This is a a journey that we are on with God to keep eternal perspectives in everything. Um, And and we, we serve and we worship a God who is full of grace and mercy. 
and has given us the Holy Spirit that will journey with us um, through this journey. So cling to that hope and cling to that promise. But something that's really helped me is, is just keeping a question at the forefront of my mind. And, and it's very simple. Am I seeing this through an eternal perspective or a temporary one? And I've, I keep coming back to this, what would Jesus do? And it seems, it, it's, it's, it's an old saying, it seems a little bit corny, but I actually think it, it's really quite important. What would Jesus do? When, when you, I don't know, have your appointment this week and they ask you what you're doing this weekend, would Jesus, yeah, would Jesus tell them that they were going to church or not? You know, questions like that. How do you keep your eternal perspective? And how can you be sharing the gospel with, with people you come in contact with this week? God called the church of Sardis to keep in mind the joy of their salvation and to repent in order to strengthen the good that they have. And he's calling us to do the same so that we may adopt an eternal perspective in all that we do and be a body of Christ that is categorized by life, both in reputation and in the eyes of Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we are sorry for the ways that we have and we keep temporary perspective in our lives. Lord, we want to repent of, of our actions and our deeds that have come from not keeping you at the forefront of our minds. Lord, we're sorry for our, our unfinished deeds um, and our missed opportunity of sharing Jesus with others. Lord, please this week remind us of the joy of our salvation. Lord, would you help us to keep the gospel at the forefront of our minds, the joy that, that we have relationship with you, Lord, and let that joy fill us to the point that we just can't help but share it with other people. Father, give us hearts that are zealous and that are full of passion for sharing the gospel with others. Lord, yeah, we just invite you to partner with us. Holy Spirit, walk with us um, and transform our hearts so that they look more like you. God, I pray this week that you will be continuing to reveal to us ways that we might have um, temporary perspective rather than eternal. Lord, would we be open to, to receiving those that from you? God, I just pray that we would be adopting an eternal perspective in all that we do. Lord, change our hearts, make us more like you, mould us um, and, and give us a spirit of, of repentance and surrender to you. In your name, amen.